Hello, everybody. My name is Courtney, and I'm an alcoholic. Cheers already has me on the sentiers. I brought um, my friend's watch up here tonight because I want to be sober by 8.30. And, um, oh, I didn't know you had a clock back there as well. Um, because I hate it when I speak, and I'm still, like, you know, in college, and it's, like, 20 till. And I'm like, oh, I better, I've got a lot more years to talk about. Um, my name is Courtney, once again, and my sobriety date is July 6th of 2009. So God willing, in a little bit less than two months, I should be picking up a four-year trip if I um, you know, continue to be spiritually fit and do all the things that you know, I have been doing to get to this point. Um, I have a home group, Pittsburgh. Um, it's a smaller group, not quite this big, and the room's about a fourth of this size. But um, I found a home there, and um, I love I love the people there, and um, I found my sponsor there, and a lot of other wonderful people. So there's something really special going on in that room, and I feel like all of us should feel that about our home group. Um, Trish is the best sponsor in the whole world, and I feel like everybody should feel that way about their sponsor. And not only do I have a sponsor, but Trish has a sponsor who has a sponsor who has a sponsor, and on down the line. I feel like um, sponsorship is extremely important. Um, this is a WE program. And I know that if I tried to sponsor myself when I was out there, and I wound up here. So I needed help when I got here, and Trish happened to be that person. Um, I'll, I'll get to a little bit more of our story after I qualify myself for a few minutes. Um, I also, um, drugs are a part of my story. I'm not going to go into that much. Um, you know, I'll just let you know what I was doing at that period of time. Along with the drinking, I identify as an alcoholic because whether it be um, for that particular night or the last two years, I, I always wanted to drink even when the drugs were gone. Um, I definitely earned a seat in our brother-sister program, but I just didn't find what I needed there. Um, I needed someone to give me a hug and tell me it was gonna be okay um, when I first got in these rooms and to love me until I could love myself. And I just didn't get that from the meeting I was going to with that. So anyway, I found my home. And thank God I did because I was, I was out there for a while. Um, I'm 36. We'll be 37 at the end of the summer, once again, God willing. And um, I uh, was born in Raleigh and to two very, very loving parents. Um, I have an older brother who just turned 40 on Wednesday. So I'm starting to feel you know, older just because of that. Um, my parents were extremely supportive, loved me in an almost like smothering kind of way. They never missed a school performance or a sporting event or anything that was going on with me. And they knew my every move and it made it um, a little bit more difficult to do what I wanted to do once I got to high school. Um, but it was always out of love and I know that now it was annoying back then. But um, it, was, it was out of love, and um, my parents stayed together. Um, my dad died in 2001 um, accidentally, and um, I'll get to later how that affected me and what happened after that. But, um, but yeah, they were together up until he died. So, you know, it came from a very loving home. Um, not a big extended family, but enough that we spent holidays and stuff together. Um, there's alcoholism on both sides of my family. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. Um, both sides. Um, when I got to high school, I was allowed to drink like at a dinner, say have a glass of wine or whatnot, but um, you know, it was definitely monitored and that was with the family. I never really had much success drinking with my family, even after I went to college and after I turned 21. Like it just wasn't fun for me because it was going to be like one or two and that simply was, that was never enough. Um, I always made good grades, but I always had to make that one B, just to be a little bit rebellious. Um, and I was a good kid. I mean, I really was. I, I was a people pleaser. And I still have some of that people pleasing. But um, it's, it's definitely downplayed. And I'm not saying I'm all out for number one now, but it's just, it's, it's just different because I realize how manipulative it is to be a people pleaser. But back then it was working for me, and teachers loved me. They always said, you know, she's a great student, you know, she's a leader and all this stuff, but she's a little chatty. And I still, I still get that. I still have problems, you know, in meetings at work and, and, and AA meetings if I sit next to the right, wrong person. You know, I like to have those side conversations, but, you know, it's just, I'm a social person. 
Um, you know, they say that alcoholics love to be love to be cuddled while they're isolating. So <laughs> anyway, um, it wasn't until I was 14. It was first weekend of my freshman year in high school when um, I had my first drink. I mean, I remember taking little sips of my dad's beers when I was younger, or like in the single digits. But you know, there wasn't any like hardcore like stealing his beer or anything. It was definitely that first weekend of my freshman year. We were living in Richmond at the time. Um, we had moved there when I was in third grade, and um, the girls all spent the night over at my friend Shannon's house. The boys that we were friends with spent the night at another guy's house who had lived in the neighborhood, and we met at the pool, you know, like after all the parents were asleep, and somebody's older brother had gotten us the beer, and I drank, I drank four Milwaukee's Best, and yeah, so I never even had like a two-drink minimum from the get-go. It was four drinks. You know, I was I was definitely setting my standard. Um, I remember walking back to the to Shannon's house. There were like four or five of us there, and um, I remember I had to use the bathroom, and I got in the bathroom. It was one of those little downstairs powder rooms, and like the room was spinning, and it was just it should have been really unenjoyable. But I really liked it. I really really liked that feeling of being out of myself and people laughing even harder at my jokes, but remember they were all drinking too. And um, you know, I just really, I really liked it. Um, you know, I always fit in, like I had, I had friends in different, friends from class and friends from tennis and friends from this, that and the other. But like, I still felt like I had to fit in and like I had to go that extra mile to like ensure my spot in that group. And so that was also part of it, is the, the fitting in. And I don't know, I guess I, in, in reflection, um, since I've gotten sober, I guess I always felt like my place wasn't like secure. And that was my insecurity, that like if I didn't do what they were doing, then they might like kick me out of the group or whatever. So, you know, that's a rough age anyway, those, you know, early teens and, and you know, it's just it's rough I work with high school girls now and I see those insecurities just you know running rampant and, and um, anyway so I continued to drink I was also like a really accomplished tennis player and so I was either at a tennis tournament every weekend or I was getting drunk every weekend and I got um, after my freshman year in high school my brother graduated from high school in Richmond we moved to Burlington North Carolina and I found my group I had my tennis friends and I had my fr like you know, weekend friends and stuff. And, and, you know, I was friends with lots of, lots of different groups, but I always knew where the party was, and it was either getting drunk or going to a tennis tournament. And so that continued throughout high school, and I got caught, I got caught exactly once every year by my parents, and I was grounded for a month each time. And, you know, it, it never slowed me down. I mean, for that month, yes, it did. I would just play more tennis or something, but, you know, it, it didn't slow me down. I knew that I liked it and I liked it a lot. So anyway, when I went to college, um, I decided not to play tennis because I didn't want to wake up at like six in the morning and run. I wanted a, I remember thinking this my senior year, I was like, I want a different college experience, meaning I wanted to drink, you know, I wanted to party. I already knew I liked it that much. And so in college, um, I, I experimented with, with some of that green stuff my senior year in high school, and by the time, by the end of my freshman year at State, um, I was doing that every day, and I was, I was not drinking as much, I mean, here and there at parties, but every time I drank, I definitely got wasted, was throwing up, um, you know, people were taking care of me, and I was like, the, you know, I was, I was definitely, um, you know, putting in those layers of, you know, building up to that imaginary line. So I made it through college in four years, and um, my mom asked me, and maybe my dad was in on this too, you know, well, what do you want to do after after you graduate? Because I, I was going to have a psychology degree, and I was like, well, I want to take a year off and live at the beach. And they're like, you know, and they're like, well, who's going to pay for that? And I was like, you mean you're not? And they were like, no, we're not going to pay for that. You either can get a real job or you can go to graduate school. And I was like, well, I'm not ready for a real job. I'll, you know, go to graduate school. So I moved back to Burlington in, with my parents and went to A&T in Greensboro to work on my master's degree in counseling and because that was a natural you know, progression from the psychology. So 
And I'm so glad I went to graduate school when I did because later on in my 20s, that certainly when my mind was pickled and I definitely couldn't have done that. So went to graduate school, moved back to Burlington, and the people who were in Burlington, whom I knew, were not because they had just graduated and are moving back to, to further their education. It's because they've been kicked out or of school or never went to college or, you know, whatever. And there was a, um, they like to do that other stuff that likes to keep you up and you're not hungry and it's just, you know, really expensive and everything. But that was the scene. And like within a month, I'd given away all my paraphernalia and I moved on from, well, when I, I turned 21 at the beginning of my senior year and I discovered the bars. Um, like Hillsborough Street and all that. And so, like, I moved from beer to definitely drinking liquor. I mean, I'd had liquor before, but, like, liquor was definitely, you know, I liked all the all the different drinks, and people had drink specials, and I liked getting dressed up and all that stuff. So um, I was definitely, you know, just moved right on into that scene in Burlington and stopped that one and picked up the other, and it allowed me to drink more is what it did for me. It allowed me to drink more. And I did make it through graduate school, thank goodness, and, and it was a 60-hour program, so it took me three years because I was also working, like, for a friend's parents um, as their, like, Girl Friday. And my partying definitely increased. I experimented with some other things. But once, like I said at the beginning, you know, when the drugs were gone for the night, I still wanted to drink. And I still, I mean, we used to buy beer from our favorite dive, called Brew Balls in Burlington, right near Elon College. And um, we used to buy beer, like, by the six, like, we'd each buy a six-pack at before 2 o'clock because then, you know, legally they have to stop selling it. We would buy it to go, and the only thing was that you couldn't unscrew the tops until you were, like, off the premises. So, like, Chuck, the owner, would let us do that, and, um, you know, so we could just continue the party. So, um... Made it through graduate school and I actually got a 4 I don't know how I did <laughs> looking back on it because my weekends would start like on Wednesday, you know, like I was, I was, yeah, it was, but I, I did it. I was somehow still balancing all those balls that we balance in the air for however long and it's when they start falling that, you know, things, you know, you start having repercussions. I still didn't have any repercussions. Um, you know, my parents weren't happy because they thought, you know, if she goes out, she should be home by 2.30. And I had a curfew. It was 2.30. I mean, that wasn't seeming like too much to ask. But, you know, I didn't want the party to end ever. So it was a lot, you know, it was still a lot of fun then. And, you know, for me, it's like I wouldn't have ever gotten to the point to cross that imaginary line if it wasn't fun at some point. You know, if I had had, like, immediate repercussions, who knows. But that's just not how it happened. Um, so, graduate school's over. I'm definitely not going to get my PhD at this point. Like, I'm done with school. And so, I have to, I have to get a job at this point. And my mom's a school teacher. And um, so, she kind of had an in with the school system. And um, so, because she's like, you know, she's a very revered teacher. And um, so, I got a, a counseling job at the school where she worked. It was in middle school. And the first year was when, that was 2001, that was when my dad died. He died December 11th, and basically we couldn't, he was working in Lynchburg, we couldn't get in touch with him that weekend. We didn't know, we had one of his coworkers go over to his house, and he was calling my mom saying, you know, his car's in the driveway, but the doors are locked, blah, blah, blah. So, called the police, and then we didn't hear anything for several hours, and then the Burlington Police Department came and knocked on my mom's door to let us know that my dad had died. And it was an accidental death. My dad had the beginnings of cirrhosis of the liver. And I thought for about a year after he died that he had to have been drunk to have fallen. He hit his head on a radiator and had some hemorrhaging. And it took me a year to, to even be able to ask, you know, about the autopsy. So, it, and he did not have a drop of anything in his system. So, I don't know exactly what happened, but... It hit me really hard being the daddy's girl that I am, and my mom and I are so much alike that like, I we've butted heads. It's not so much anymore, but back then we were definitely butting heads because we're so much alike. And um, so I was a I was definitely a daddy's girl growing up. I was this little apprentice, and I you know he taught me a lot of things um, about you know around the house and stuff. So anyway, it was a shock, and it was it was horrible. It was a horrible time. 
And, um, you know, we had all this family coming in, and my brother was um, a newlywed and he, living in Manhattan with his wife, and they came down, and he kind of, like, took over, you know, being the male. It was just, the, you know, just, I said it was just my brother and me. And, like, I, you know, I started building resentment about that. Not that I wanted to handle any of those affairs, but, like, that's kind of when that when the divide started happening with my brother and me because we come from the same gene pool. And when this happened, he, I mean, he probably didn't, well, I don't know how much he drank, but he's definitely a drinker. And he chose to, you know, like dive into his work. Whereas I'm convinced in hindsight that it was within a year after that, after my dad's death, that I crossed that imaginary line and I became an alcoholic. And so, um, I'm working as a counselor at the school where my mom works, and um, I somehow make it through that first year. Like, that was in December. I made it through till June or whenever school got out. Um, I had my summer off, and um, I just partied really, really hard. And I was partying hard, too, during that first school year. However, I was still managing to juggle, and I think I got a little bit of leeway because of what had just happened in my life. You know, like, if I got a little bit too drunk, which happened a lot, you know, like, my friends were like, oh, you know, she's going through a tough time. Well, that summer, then, you know, I had the summer off, and it just continued at summertime, and then that next year, I was definitely struggling to my, like, party life, and then my work life, like, I was staying out later and later. My weekends were once again starting on Wednesday. And um, one morning, right before Thanksgiving, um, I had been up all night drinking and using that other stuff. Oh yeah, and I was still using that other stuff, working as a middle school counselor, and, um, and drinking up heavily. And I'd been out all night, and I had these parent conferences. It was a Thursday. I had these parent conferences that afternoon that I didn't want to have to reschedule. And so I went into work, and they smelled alcohol in my breath. And I got sent to the principal's office. Somebody told the principal. And as an employee, I got sent to the principal's office. The principal called central office. They came and picked me up from the principal's office, out the back door of the school, like the side door thing. And I went down there, and I was given a breathalyzer, and I was given a drug test, and I failed both miserably. They put me on medical leave. For a month, they told me to come back in January. This is right before Thanksgiving. They told me to come back in January. And in order to keep my job, I had to go to an outpatient program at LMS Regional Medical Center. They told me it would take like six to eight sessions, you know, no big deal, just complete the program and you can have your, you can come back to work in January. Well, being a counselor and being a master manipulator and being the cunning, baffling person that, or the cunning person that I am, it took me. 22 sessions. I was there in February because I was trying to like play this program. However, that program, one of the requirements was two AA meetings. That was my first introduction to AA. I was not ready to get sober, but I went to these meetings and that was definitely an introduction. And I actually just had the 10 year anniversary of that last December because it was two days before New Year's um, of 2003. Well, on and on, um, like, they let me come back to work, but I was still like, I would just call out sick completely. If I thought there was any way I was gonna get, like I stayed out too late the night before, I did not have a very good attendance record that next semester, and um, they, they didn't renew my, um, they didn't fire me, but they didn't renew my contract. So, um, after that, I took the summer off, and I was just, because I still had paychecks coming in, then I got a job at, at um, a department store, and by this time, I was um, t I would take a drink into work. I was working in the home department, and we had this huge storeroom. I would take a drink into work with me and take my little other stuff, and I would, you know, just, you know, that's how I would make it through my work day. During that time, my grandmother died and left all the grandchildren a nice sum of money. And so after I got that, I was like, um, well, I don't think I really need to work, and which was the worst thing I could have done, um, you know, but I, I couldn't, I was pretty much unemployable, you know, like at that point, and I just, you know, I, it, anyway, it was, it was a really bad time. I was back living with my mom, um, and we fought all the time, um, 
And um, it was during this time that definitely I was using a whole lot of that other stuff and, and the drinking going along with it. And I um, wasn't really eating. I was weighing, I weighed like 122 pounds. Oh, I, you know, I just, I wasn't hungry for like five years. I mean, it just was, I, mean, I was always thirsty, never hungry. So um, I was, you know, feeling like, I mean, I was, I was actually like worried about, you know, well, gosh, I'm really not getting any vitamins or anything. So I started mixing my morning drink with V, like I do vodka and V8 because it had vitamins in it. Like I thought I was a genius, you know. And so that was like my only like s sustenance pretty much, um, you know, unless I just pour something down. I got, um, oh, and right after they didn't renew my contract, I got my first DUI. I got my second DUI the next year. One of my friends with whom I used and drank um, thought I should, I've been talking about taking a cruise because, you know, that would have been a wonderful time to do that because I needed a vacation for my vacation of a life, my vacation of, you know, drinking and using. And, um, and she said, Courtney, I think you need to go away for a little while. This is after I got the second DUI. The first one's still in court from the year before, like. And, um, and I was like, oh, really? You think I should take that cruise? She's like, no, you need to go to rehab. Like, you need some help. So I went to Fellowship Hall for 28 days. I was 28 days dry. Once again, I, was, I did not feel like I was ready to be sober. But I did learn, you know, all of these times I'm going to these meetings, I'm picking up little tidbits. Like I had a sponsor back when I was going to meetings for like a year and um, off and on and I would pick up dirty chips and, you know, I was just, I was just, you know, lying to myself mostly, but lying to all the people who cared about me too. But, you know, I picked up a sponsor because um, it was suggested to me and I was like, okay, if it'll appease you, then I'll get a sponsor, you know. And um, she taught me that you have to put legs on your prayers, and I've never forgot. I've never forgotten that. And my grand sponsor has won up that and said, "God is not Santa Claus. You know, you have to put legs on your prayers. You don't just pray for things and hope that you know you win the lottery on that. Um, you have to do some footwork as well." So um, after rehab, I came back, and it was just I just got an apartment, and it was just you know I just. I, I just wasn't ready. Obviously, I hadn't hit bottom, and you know, all of, all of my friends had dropped me. You know, it was just it was just a really really lonely bad time. And um, finally, I moved into an Oxford house because we thought that would help me. And I finagled the drug test to get in there, and um, I was sober for about thirty days. And and I was going to meetings and everything, and looking for a job. And this is one in Chapel Hill, and I met a guy. We relapsed together, and. Anyway, through that and some other people I met, I ended up being moved to Pittsburgh and, um, and kind of moved around for about a year. And then, um, and then I met Tommy, and he took me in. Yes, he was, you know, I'm, I'm not taking his inventory, but we drank and used together. And um, he's also in the program. Now he has, he has more sobriety than I do. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and we did that for a few years. I was on probation for the DUIs. Cause I got another one right after I got out of rehab and um, and it was just uh, you know I, I couldn't do the probation thing because I was I was seriously unemployable at this point I was sleeping with a 40 underneath my you know in my pillowcase um, I um, just never could get enough um, it was never enough no matter how much we bought of the alcohol it was it was never going to be enough um, they revoked my probation, and I went to prison for four months, three weeks, and two days. Down at Rocky Mount, it was minimum security, and I realized that there was a common denominator with like 95% of us there, and it was this one drug in particular. And so I decided that I wasn't gonna do that when I got back out, and I haven't done any drugs since. I continued to drink, I got, off, I got out on August 11th, and um, my sobriety date being in July, so I drank for almost two years after that. Never got any better. It never got any better. I just got lonelier and more upset, and I cried every single day. I cried, and it's not, I mean, I felt sorry for myself, but I felt like such a disappointment to all the people who did love me. And at this point, my mom paid for a cell phone for me just so I could call her and she could hear my voice. It, she didn't want to talk to me. She didn't want any sort of conversation. She didn't want to hear any more of my lies. 
She simply wanted to know that I was breathing. So Tommy got sick in April of 2009. And um, he went to the hospital and he got drained out and pumped up, as I like to say. He hasn't had a drink since, so his, uh, his, his date's April 10th. I haven't had any beer, wine, or liquor since then, but my disease took me and I made the choice to take nips of mouthwash. And believe me, that is it. I still cringe when I come around the corner in like the dollar store or somewhere and I'm not, I'm not expecting it. It still makes me do one of these to see it. Um, I was just, you know, taking nips to kind of take the shakes off. My sponsor and I can jokingly say that I detox myself. I don't recommend it at all. Um, that stuff can rot out your gut really, really quickly. And especially with all the, you know, other stuff I'd had for like 17, 18 years of drinking. Um, one night, I had too many nips. I got wasted, blacked out. Um, I remember having a verbal fight with Tommy. And then he went, we kind of live on some family land and his dad lives like across the street. Well, he lived across the street from us and, um, and woke up the next morning and Tommy wasn't there. I didn't know if I had a place to live. I'm not from Pittsburgh. I don't know anywhere else to go. And like, that was it for me. So my sobriety date is July 6th and, um, came in, I've, I've been going to meetings with Tommy since April. I'd asked for Trisha's number three times and never called her. But after that, I was like, can I get your number one more time? And she's told me since that she was like, she wanted to say, I will be your sponsor. You know, I will do this for you, you know, not do it for me. But you don't, you know, but, but she was waiting for me to ask her. And I finally did. And, um, and really, I needed someone to, I chose Trish because every meeting she would come in and she would be just this glow. And she still has that glow. I mean, and... And I wanted that. I knew I had that in me somewhere. It was still there. It was very, very dim. But there was enough of it to kind of like get the wheels turning again. And like I said, I've had experience in AA. I mean, I've been to rehab, you know. Like, I knew what it was all about. I knew where to go. But I had to hit that bottom for myself. I had to get there for myself. I couldn't do it for anybody else. Because this is my issue. That, and when I came to the rooms, it became, you all could help me, all of you wonderful people. So starting going to Pittsburgh, Tommy and I, neither one of us had a, had a license at this point. Of course, with three DUIs, I'm not going to have a license for, for a hot minute. But um, <laughs> so it's, I always said Tommy's family, you know, because we, we live around Tommy's family. He's from Pittsburgh. And I always said Tommy's family will get you to work and they'll get you to church. Turns out they'll get you to AA too when they, when they you know, because they've been taking care of us for a long time. And, um, you know, so that was wonderful. His dad would drive us to meetings, his sister, his brother, um, you know, whomever, Trish would come pick us up. And, um, you know, I started working some steps. One, I, I had already done, like, when after that last mouthwash drinking experience, like, I saw where it had taken me and that I was completely powerless. Um, I've always heard that one, two, and three, and this is from 10 years ago. I can't, he can, so why don't you let him? One, two, and three. So I already had, like Trish said, I already had a pretty good spiritual base. But I expanded that to, instead of being all in my will and all about me, it was, it was asking God for his will. And I still take it back today sometimes. But at least I realize it pretty quickly on when I feel uncomfortable in a situation and I feel like I'm trying to force something. I'm like, hmm, maybe that's because it's your will and not God's. Let's take a look at this, you know. Um, and so it was. It became a relief when after Trish and I like met about it and talked about it and I thought about it and I wrote about it. Um, you know, I realized that it was it was a big relief not to have to be in charge and behind the wheel all the time. Now, I, you know, I, I definitely pray. I get on my knees every morning. And if I forget to do it in the morning because I'm out of bed so quickly, then I'm in the car. I like to pray in the car. I turn off the radio. And I just, you know, just talk to God. It doesn't have to be anything formal, and I don't have to have my little altar with candles or anything like that. It's just my relationship with my higher power, whom I choose to call God. That's all it is. I, I like to complicate things, and I like to make things really you know, more than they are, and, um, 
And but it really it's just it's my relationship with him and talking to him. However, you know whatever's whatever's coming to me. Um, four, four I did in January after of 2010. So I've been sober for like a little bit over six months. And it took me. Th I didn't like the whole like the what's put in the book. You know I was gotta do things my way. I know that's my will again, but. I told Trish my concerns. I was like, if I try to fit everything in these little columns, I'm going to want it to be perfect, and I, I'd probably still be working on it now. So she said, Courtney, do it however you feel comfortable. The most important thing is that you do it, and you do it completely, and you do it truthfully, and it, it, that, that you don't leave anything out that you can remember. So I wrote 29 pages. And I only wrote on the front so I could do my little inserts right on the back of a page and write arrows and do all that good stuff. And it took me like three months because I could not work on it every day. It was it was a lot. It was because I started from the beginning. And I just, um, it was that and the fifth step were the most freeing things I've ever done. I felt so alive and so just relieved that like I didn't have to hold on to all those secrets anymore I didn't have to do that I didn't have to like I felt like I was walking around like this like with all this stuff I had done and I'm such a horrible person but the thing is we're not bad people trying to be good we are sick people trying to get well and that's what I've done like just just working on myself and trying to get well and not beating myself up and because I do, I love to beat myself up and, and it's kind of the perfectionist and the addict and all that in, for me. Um, I like to give myself a you know swift kick in the ass every once in a while and sometimes I deserve it, I really do. But then, then we, that comes from a 10th step and then maybe circling back to four and five and making an amends to somebody, you know, back to nine. So it's kind of like those steps, because I do, I work the steps if I need to rework a step because I've missed something or I've done something else, then, you know, and how I treat people, then, then I have to do that, you know, to stay spiritually fit. Um, then I was so worn out after five, I took a break. <laughs> and um, that probably wasn't such a good idea. I felt like I mentally and emotionally needed a break, so I took a few months and just went to meetings and like, you know, did my thing. And um, I, the shortcomings and the character defects, yes, I did six and seven, but I've also had to go back and do that again because as I am sober longer, more things come apparent to me that it are my shortcomings. And some of them I really like to hold on to as well because I've had them for so long and it's comfortable. I don't know what it feels like not to be whatever that character defect may be. So, you know, there's still some work to do there for sure. With the amends, I, um, as I see people I haven't seen in a long time or um, I've written some letters, um, I have um, made some phone calls. I have, especially when I go to Burlington because a lot of my using and stuff was in, in drinking was, was in Burlington. But, you know, I'll make a phone call and, and make an amend or um, go out to lunch. And some of us to my friends that, like, we're still, we're still, like, really good friends, like my high school friends. And, like, I'll, something, I'll remember something and I'll apologize. And they're like, I don't even remember that. Are you sure that happened? And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that happened. They're like, well, we're fine. I don't, you know. And it's really my anticipation of the event of making the amends and the apology is is way bigger than what it actually turns out to be they are scary you know looking towards them but when i'm actually doing them they're they're not as bad as i ever anticipated 10 i do on a daily basis sometimes um over and over again because i do make mistakes um i've had two big emotional relapses since i got um sober one was um i came home from work one day and it had been a really tough shift i used to work these like 48 hour shifts at my job and um, it was, and I, like I said, I worked with teenage girls as a counselor. And um, I came home, and something was wrong with the power bill, and I just exploded and and like just went just went off. And 
Um, Trish hates it when I tell this story, but, um, you know, like I had to make some amends to, to Tommy and his brother, who's a bishop, was outside in our yard and the windows were open. He heard every word I said and, you know, it was just, yeah, it was just a big blow up. And when I told Trish about it, when I called her later on that afternoon, she was like, when's the last time you bought yourself an outfit? And I was like, it's been a while. And she's like, I think that's what you need to do. She hates it because she says I take that out of context. What she was saying was I was so busy like working and, and doing all this other stuff and I wasn't taking care of myself. Um, you know, I definitely am all about like sponsorship and, and, and giving back and I mean sponsoring other people and, and giving back and, you know, helping and my, I work in a helping profession and I'm constantly going to Burlington to like help my mom out and blah, blah, blah. But like, she was saying like, I wasn't taking any time for me. I wasn't doing anything for me and not to totally take that. I didn't even take that like in a selfish way. It was like, okay, you know, maybe I do need to like take a walk every once in a while and like, you know, learn how to, how to take some time for me because if I'm not healthy and I'm not spiritually where I need to be, I can't help anybody else anyway. So it's kind of a moot point. Um, the other time happened, um, that was like January, February, a year ago, probably February if the windows were up. But um, the other time was, um, I guess it was like January of this year, and um, we'd have a, we'd had this big thing happen at my job um, where my boss got fired, and there was a lot of stuff put on um, those of us who were like supervisors, and um, so I was just like working and sleeping and going to one meeting a week. My my baseline has been three. I try to get to more than that, but like during this period of time, this past winter, like it was just, all I could do was work and sleep and work and sleep. And like maybe go to my Friday night home group. Well, I just let things build up, and um, I yelled at a coworker in a staff meeting, and it was just our department. Thank God it wasn't the whole school. But like I yelled at her about something that like shouldn't, it, it wasn't that big of a deal, and I really could have, I really should have talked to her about it separately. And you know, I embarrassed myself and um, ended up having to make a huge apology, and then she wanted to have um, like a mediation with the two of us and like it was just really bad and what I've learned from those two instances is that, that I let Uncle Fester come and live in my in my mind and in my spirit you know who Uncle Fester is when you let things build up and then it you know builds up into a big resentment and that's that's when I lose my stuff that's I have to deal with things a little bit at a time and that's why I have a network, and that's why I have the best sponsor in the whole world. And that's why I have people I talk to, because I cannot, that is like one of my biggest offenders, I cannot let things build up inside of me, because it's gonna come out sideways, and sideways is never pretty. That's what I tell the teenage girls I work with. I'm like, sideways is always ugly, and you always are gonna you know, say things that you don't wanna say. And um, yeah, we had our, the topic last night in my home group was anger, and I thought about this too. But you know, it's just I've I've got to get things out, even if it's not talking to that person directly. Just talking about it, period. Writing about it, you know, talking to my dog about it, like whomever. I just cannot let it build up inside of me. Um, you know, I try to give back as much as I can. Um, I um, have a pretty tough work schedule right now, and so I've added a noon meeting because I go to work at two. So I hit the sand for noon meeting and then drive to Sadler City for my job. Like I have to make, I have to make sure I'm like doing what I need to do to take care of me, so I can stay spiritually fit and I can stay involved. Um, and I just, I love this program with all of my heart and soul. Before I got sober, being an alcoholic was the most detrimental thing. For me, it was the worst thing I had going for me. And now that I have a program, being an alcoholic is the best thing that could have happened to me because I have somewhere to go and I have a program because unfortunate things happen to non-alcoholics too. People have deaths, people lose jobs, people are short on their bills. You know, people crash their cars sober. I never did, but. They were, I was always wasted when I crashed my cars. But, you know, it happens. And unfortunate things happen to those other people too. But they don't have, they don't have groups like this. They don't have sponsors to call. 
they don't have all these wonderful people and steps to work over this stuff that happens to everybody. We have a way to deal with it. And I didn't know how to deal with it before. Even back in the day when I was going to, 10 years ago when I was picking up dirty chips. Like, yeah, I picked up some tidbits, but I wasn't working a program by any means. I just, um, I just know that I have somewhere to go. And I have people who love me, love me, love me. And I love them, love them, love them. And even if I just AA love them, you know, like the people that you wouldn't really hang out with outside the meetings or they rub you the wrong way and, you know, in um, business meetings or whatever, like I still AA love them. I would never want them to go back out. So of course I'm in therapy. If they call me, I'm going to pick up the phone, you know? So it's through that love and, and this program that I have a life that four years ago I could have never dreamed of. This job that I have, I was six months sober and I was at the Siler City meeting and this group of teenage girls walked in and I was like, who are those girls? They look really young, you know, because they're like up to 18. And someone next to me said, oh, they go to this boarding school, um, you know, outside of Tyler and, and um, you know, it's therapeutic, whatever. And I, and I thought to myself, God, I want to work there one day. And at two years sober, guess what? I got a job there. And I love it. I pull up to work every day. And I know that's where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. Yes, it's frustrating and exhausting. And sometimes I just, you know, have to really pray about some things. But I love it. And I'm giving back, you know. Like, I'm helping those, I'm helping those girls. I know I am. And I'm also a sister again. My brother sent me a text the other day, and he said, I'm proud to call you my sister. I never thought I'd hear that from him again. Because he didn't want to talk to me at all. He didn't even want me to call him and let him know I was alive. Like, I'm not saying he wished me dead, but he didn't, you know, he would just hear from my mom that, yes, I was still alive and kicking it. Um, my mom counts on me today. I'm her in case of emergency person with her doctors. Like, that's amazing that, that, that someone could call me from a doctor's office and I could be there in 40 minutes because I have a license again today. And I'm almost finished with my blow and go. You know, like this is amazing stuff. This is amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. I'm saving money so I can buy, I can treat myself to a car. Yeah, I was on the three-year plan. And um, yeah, it goes by faster than anything it's going to. But um, yeah, you know, like these things are absolutely amazing. I didn't think I could ever get back to this point. I knew it could be better than it was when I was waking up and drinking every day. But I had no clue that it could be like this. I had no clue. And, you know, so don't sell yourself short. If you're new in here, keep coming back. Keep coming until you want to come. I mean, nobody wants to say, oh, I'm going to go to AA meetings forever. <laughs> until you get to the point and you're like, I love my AA meetings. I love my home group. And even the people I only AA love. I still love seeing them, you know, like I still love seeing them come back in and they've got two, because we meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they've got two more days sober. You know, like that's awesome. That is so awesome. So don't sell yourself short. Keep coming back because this is what works. You have to work at it and you have to put your heart and soul into it, but it's the most important, rewarding and um, important, rewarding, and it's just the best thing I've ever done. It is, and it's all because of my higher power and the things that happened to me along the way. It took all those little instances to build that and build that and build that until I had that realization that day. So thank you for letting me share, and I hope I helped at least one person to keep coming back. Thank you.